a truism here, and that is story is story and story is written, sort of. Those of you who followed uh, in the news possibly the organization effort uh, with reality television in conjunction with the Writers Guild a few years ago, um, one of the arguments that we were constantly hearing was reality shows aren't written, well they're not written. Reality shows do in fact have outlines that are written for them. Uh, there are moments where things are written to be picked up, interview content, etc. Uh, there are a number of elements uh, of traditional writing that are present in reality television. We'll get to all of those again once we get into the section on pre-production, production, and post. Now the first thing I want to do to sort of illustrate to you how reality shows are actually written is something in the book uh, that we call the Home Improvement Show exercise. I say this because anybody who's a mechanic or who's ever done any kind of work on older cars, you love to work on older cars because the parts are bigger, uh, things are simpler, they're not uh, overly complicated and they're best to learn on. And I refer to home improvement shows as kind of, the, kind of the old cars or the lab frogs where it's very easy to see what everything is inside. So let's talk about what your average home improvement reality show would look like. I'm talking about the kind of things you'll see on HGTV, the things you'll see on DIY. Um, basically, they're going to structure out like this. You're going to have your opening titles. You'll have the introduction of the host or the contractor, which establishes who that person is, why they're an authority, and why you should be listening to them. They'll then introduce the location. Uh, they'll also introduce the homeowner and then the project. What is it that we're going to be doing today? Then you have a consultation where they talk about how they plan to attack whatever this project is. They'll start the work, the commencement of work. Then you'll have the introduction of the first hurdle. Now the introduction of the first hurdle is going to be something like, well, we tried to knock out a wall and then we realized that it had a gas line in it that we didn't realize was there. It's something that has to be overcome, something that's sort of gives you some sort of stakes, like if we can't get past this, we can't move on with the project. Won't necessarily be earth shattering, but it'll be enough to get you to a commercial break. Later in the show, you'll have the introduction of the second larger hurdle. This could be something uh, like you know, getting shut down because your permits weren't in order, something that's big enough that it might actually torpedo the project. You'll overcome the second hurdle, you'll finish the project, and then there'll be a review of the project. Now what's interesting about this is any of you who have studied traditional screenwriting, especially if you're fans of Sid Field, will notice that this sort of breaks down in the same, in the same way. You have your first hurdle, your second hurdle. Um, these are all mapped out. These type of reality shows have checklists in the field that we're going to hit this, we're going to hit this. Um, they'll realize what the hurdles are or make something out of you know, make a big deal of something might not be so big, using interview content, using whatever they have to bolster it. But it really follows the same type of structure as motion pictures and television as we know it. Now, if there are people who are doing these outlines and they're writing for reality shows, why do we not see writers credited on reality shows? Well, I'll tell you, there's a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is the, there are a lot of places that really still believe that crediting a writer on a reality show will blow the illusion that the show is occurring somehow magically in real time. Nothing in life happens in perfect 60-minute chunks with 22 minutes of commercial breaks. I don't know why we're so worried about the, the illusion being shattered or people worrying about reality shows being manipulated. There are reality shows that are over-manipulated, and that's something that you have to watch out for. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But mostly the reason you don't see writers credited on reality shows is a division between uh, they don't want to deal with the unionization of these shows. They're cheap to produce. That's part of the appeal. Um, if you are a writer who has worked somewhere else in the industry, and I do know a lot of people who have worked at sitcoms uh, and traditional dramas who have crossed over. Uh, I'm on a staff right now with a person who was a professional story analyst, and one of my other writers was a writer for Jon Stewart. Um, writing skills do translate, but we just may not call you a writer. You'll be called a story producer or a story editor. So what does a story producer do exactly? Um, a story producer's chief job is the compression of time. Uh, what we really do is we take a tremendous amount of source material. You're looking at anywhere from two or three days worth of shooting for an episode to up to four months, five months, even six months. Um, what we basically do is figure out how to break up 
that material into usable chunks to rearrange things to create storylines where we see reoccurring actions. Um, but again, the chief thing that a story producer does in most cases is compress time. The difficulty in explaining what a story producer does and giving you a, a complete definition of that is that it's really different on every show. Um, story producers can start at any point in the process. They can start in pre-production, they can be involved in production, or they can just be hired to do post. My personal preference, having done all three, is I enjoy working in post during the time that the show is being produced. So as material is being sent back to the field and we're putting the shows together, we can kind of see where the holes are and what's not coming in and say, well, this storyline isn't working. Would it be possible to sit two people down and ask them to have a conversation about the conflict that happened last Thursday? Um, that is not uh, manipulating content in a conspicuous way, but it is making sure that we can get from A to C uh, logically by you know, recreating B. There are shows that are very heavy-handed in the way that they produce. Most of those you can tell when you watch them. Uh, people will be asked to say very specific things, or ordinary people will suddenly sound very clever as if Diablo Cody is in the back of their head with a little lever system telling them what to say. Um, that's poor producing, and you can always tell uh, where those holes are. Uh, moving on, timeline, what timeline? Well, the timeline of a reality show uh, should be perceived as being continuous, but it really isn't. I could have something that happens on the first day of a show that I don't decide to use until, you know, three episodes in um, because it relates to another storyline. Uh, it just has to make sense. The audience has to buy into the fact that the actual chronology is playing out. Um, you might say, why do you have to alter the timeline? Sometimes you really don't, um, but it's helpful when you're creating a storyline. You have A, B, and C stories just as you do in regular uh, scripted programming. An A story may have four beats that took place over the course of two or three months. You put those together and it just sort of seems like it happens over the course of a few days. Suddenly things are making sense uh, and things really seem to be cooking. Look at your own life. Um, a month in your own life might not be terribly interesting, but if I just cherry pick the best moments out of that month that relate to each other and strung them all together, it would look like you were really kind of humming along. And that's what we do with reality shows. Now authenticity is exactly what I've been talking about. Um, the audience has to buy into the idea that that timeline is actually authentic. Um, you can't have crazy things where I've seen scenes that are cobbled together from multiple days where you'll literally see someone's shirt change in the scene when it's cut together. Um, terrible work. It, it's, it's inexcusable and the audiences are more savvy than they've ever been before. They know that things are happening. They know that stuff has been compressed. They know that we're doing pickup interviews. Uh, so keep in mind as you're working on these shows that the audience has really got to buy into it. Continuity and story basics, these are the same things uh, that I've been talking about. Uh, continuity, uh, all character actions need to be motivated. And if you can't figure out how to make them appear motivated when you're stringing your scenes together, you should really consider uh, using interview content to bolster that. We're going to talk more about that again. We're almost to the point where we're talking about pre-production, production, and post-production. We're going to get into that right now in just a few moments here. Conflict and stakes, also before we start talking about it, there is a misnomer that in reality television, conflict involves two people punching each other in the face on the boardwalk. That is not the case. Anything that is causing a person's stress or a situation to be overcome equals conflict. I don't have to be having a huge fight with Jill in order to be able to have conflict on my show. I'm about to lose my job something terrible is going to happen. I'm going to lose my house. If you watch a show like Hoarders, the conflict and the stakes are that person's quality of life is at stake. They may lose their house. There's no violence involved in that conflict. And I think most of what you hear about when you hear about reality shows uh, being you know, basically responsible for the decline of Western civilization, they're always referring to the fact that the conflict is so over the top. Um, be nuanced in the way that you use conflict. It doesn't have to be yelling. It doesn't have to be screaming. There's a lot you can do with music. There's a lot of things that you can do. 
um, in order to kind of boost that sense of, uh, of, of conflict. Uh, stakes, each character should have something that they want. If a character doesn't want anything or if a cast member doesn't want anything, there's no real purpose to them. Um, I don't really use examples from my own shows because I can't, um, but I will tell you that uh, there are shows that I have seen where there are characters who basically serve as a messenger, who are just sort of go-betweens between larger characters who are experiencing conflict. Those people do have a point, even if they don't personally have anything to gain or to lose by being the information source between the major characters. Those folks you sort of need. Now, we're going to talk about producing a reality show for just a moment. 